Okay, very good. So thanks uh, everyone who joins in uh, today. This is our first uh, seminar of the AMEDS uh, series for the year. And it's a pleasure to have uh, John Quiggin uh, kicking, uh, kicking the, the, the program uh, this, this year. So if you haven't uh, heard of John, he's a very, fam very famous, and I mean that, a decision uh, yeah. theorist and political commentator uh, in Australia for Australian politics and economics. He has like a thousand plus publications. Uh, he's a fellow of the Econometric Society. He's a fellow of the Australian Social Science Academy. He has received several uh, research uh, fellowships from the ERC. So he's the whole package. And uh, today he's going to talk about financial markets, uh, equilibrium, and bonded uh, and awareness. Uh, John, take it, take it away. You have until you have 60 minutes. Great. Uh, thanks, JC. Uh, well, thanks for that wrap. I'll try and live up to at least some of it. Um, so this is joint work with Anika Jakova from the University of Grenoble. Uh, and uh, for those who've seen it, it's uh, related to our paper in Econometrica, which looked at uh, uh, survival in financial markets with uh, cons uh, financial constraints. And it's not really, as I was saying, saying to JC before, a follow-up. We actually started by looking at the bounded awareness issue, uh, sent it to Econometrica, and they said, well, look, uh, um, it's Jack Gilboa who said, we're not really interested in bound awareness or can't pitch it to our audience, but you could recast all of this in terms of, of limited access to financial markets. And so we did that. And of course, uh, I found some new results that way. And then when we came back to the original version of the paper, uh, that was helpful and we've, we've gone on beyond that. So, so it's, it's both the prequel and the sequel to the, uh, to the Econometrica paper. So what's the background? Well, um, we have out there still sort of more or less alive, despite everything we see going on in financial markets, the efficient markets hypothesis. Uh, and it's going to say that uh, the price of an asset is, the market price of an asset is the best possible estimate of its value, uh, given all information, both public and private, that's available. That's the, uh, the strong version of the efficient market hypothesis uh, and, um, for the moment, we're not going to worry in this context about private information, we're rather going to look, except as it's constrained uh, by awareness. Now, difficult to depend on empirical grounds. We've had, um, obviously, the global financial crisis, the dot-com bubble and boom, uh, assets like Bitcoin and now YouTube videos selling for absurd prices and so forth. Uh, we won't go into all of that, but, but, and, but, and more notably, I think, uh, hard to explain and long running uh, outcomes that seem inconsistent with a standard version of the theory, the equity premium paradox, uh, the safe, safe asset paradox and the um, or puzzle uh, and excess volatility. All of these things seem to be uh, problematic. Now, uh, one obvious assumption which most people make outside economics when they're talking about um, Financial markets is well. Lots of people have wrong beliefs, and if you have wrong beliefs, of course, you can get a lot of a lot more action in financial markets than if everybody has correct correct beliefs. Uh, but going back to Bloom and Easley, who formalised it, and, and before that, I guess uh, Stigler and the Survivor Principle, uh, an argument that well, if you go into a, a financial market with wrong beliefs, uh, you lose your money and be driven out, and therefore. Uh, therefore, the price in the market ought to be set only by people with correct beliefs. Uh, the market's complete, everybody has expected utility preferences and common, common discount rates. Uh, we expect to see um, that agents with wrong beliefs can't survive if their wealth uh, goes to zero almost surely. So, um, a bunch of questions. Well, first, given that we seem to see a lot of belief heterogeneity out there, how does it last? A second question for a sort of sophisticated but boundedly rational agent like any of us, uh, we all know about Bloom and Easley. Uh, we know in essence that having correct beliefs is a probability zero event. Uh, so why would we engage in financial market trade given on any moderate base of humility, we're unlikely to be the set of zero measure with correct beliefs that survives, uh, far more likely to be in the set of measure one uh, that fails. And related to this, 
given that in some sense we have to make financial decisions, are there heuristics which will allow us to survive the financial markets, despite the fact that we understand that we have uh, incorrect beliefs? So we want to address this uh, in, the, in the context of unawareness. And um, this has been, uh, literature on this subject has been developing for 20 odd years or so. Uh, and um, it turns out to be quite tricky. That is, it's obvious to all of us that we've in the past been surprised by events, stuff we didn't see happening has happened. And therefore that in some sense we're unaware of things. It's also obvious that the world is unimaginably complex and that uh, we can't possibly have a sufficiently fine-grained description of the world to, to say everything relevant about it. But trying to incorporate that into a decision theory model is, uh, is very difficult. Uh, you can't, for example, just say, well, look, I'm going to add an extra state for something I'm not aware of because um, then you have to say, well, what's this state like? And if you make it like the other states, essentially you've just, um, uh, you've just given yourself awareness of that state just like all of the others. So anyway, there's been really uh, uh, two, um, uh, two uh, ways of thinking about this form of awareness. One is what we call restriction or reduction. That's the surprise case I mentioned, that something like COVID-19 comes out of the blue. We haven't thought about it. Most of us haven't. And, and we have to readjust our things. The other, which is, is a bit more tractable and has been analysed uh, probably going back a bit further, if Epstein looked at it a bit in the 1990s, is um, coarsening of the state space. So that says we've got all these states and you know, a huge, huge number of them. Uh, they're all different that, and lots of them are relevantly different. That is, they, they're different in terms of the implications for asset returns, but we treat them as if we're the same. And of course, any textbook illustration of, of decision theory has decision problems that have either a small finite number of states or a simply parameterized distribution across states. Um, no one ever tries to, uh, uh, in these illustrations, uh, deal with the great complexity of the world. Uh, so, um, uh, a lot of, as I say, a lot of this has been explored in, in decision theory, where uh, kind of questions that we're interested in are, can you be aware of your own unawareness? If so, how? And, uh, and how, does that, how does that affect things like equilibrium in game theory, et cetera? So, um, Simon Grant and I have a paper looking at sequential equilibrium uh, with different differential awareness. Uh, but the financial market story is big and interesting, and there has been um, has been more recently a bit of bit of development. So um, uh, uh, Modica, and Talon looked at bankruptcy in 1998. Uh, they had uh, a bit of unawareness in that, uh, not really fully developed because we didn't have an adequate decision theory. Uh, and now we've seen um, financial intermediation, arbitrage, uh, unawareness of financial assets, and um, as I say, the unawareness in terms of our seen as a constraint is what Annie and I did uh, in the Chronometric Act. Uh, so all of these, all of these issues arise, uh, we're starting to see interest in the question of, can we model financial markets in which not all agents are, fu are fully aware? So we're going to look at an infinite horizon economy. So it's, we basically are looking, uh, for those who are familiar with this literature, the same kind of setup that Bloom and Easley have. Uh, agents trade over an infinite lifetime and the question is, does their wealth go to zero over time? Uh, but unlike, unlike Bloom and Easley, we're going to have differential wins. Uh, so all of, in, this, in this story, and this is one of the most, more difficult problems that, that remain in literature, uh, as in, uh, as in Bloom and Easley, uh, trade occurs ex ante. People make plans and, and stick to them. We don't change awareness over time. Now, uh, that really isn't a problem with full awareness because the infinitely rational person can make a contingent decision for every possible thing that could be realized. Uh, and if they're expecting utility, uh, they would never want to change those, uh, they never want to change those uh, decisions afterwards. Uh, that's what dynamic consistency means. So, even, and that's true, even if you turn out to have, uh, have wrong beliefs, uh, that, that um, adjusting those beliefs can be fitted in reason. So, 
Uh, and we're going to look at unawareness of coarsening. So what that means, that occurs as a constraint on the assets I can hold. That is, uh, supposing uh, that I am uh, an Australian, I'm unaware that there's, uh, uh, I'm unaware that there's uh, a, market, a foreign exchange market, even though, of course, changes in the exchange rate of the dollar, um, changes in the exchange rate of the dollar are going to affect returns on my assets. I can't trade on events which include Australian dollar rises or falls against the US dollar because my awareness uh, my awareness lumps together any two states that differ only in the in the value of the Australian dollar exchange rate. So uh, this has an impact on how I allocate risk that I can't there's certain kinds of insurance that aren't available to me and as we'll see, it means that prices can systematically deviate from where they ought to be. Um, can I ask you a clarifying yeah. question? When you say differential unawareness, that means that uh, I and you may not have the same awareness, meaning That's we correct. have different coarsening of the... Yes. Okay. And we cannot observe any, any information. So you cannot observe my decisions. Can you observe my decisions? Could you infer the type of information that I have? Uh, well, bear in mind, it isn't information. So it's not about what information you have, but what states you consider. So yeah, if you're, if I am unaware of the foreign exchange market and you're trading in it, I don't okay. observe that or pay any oh, attention. Oh, I see. Okay, you don't observe. Okay, cool. Yeah, if I'm unaware of it. you know, you could deduce. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this isn't, this has a lot of similarities to the sort of uh, information story, but but it, it's, um, it's not the same thing. Um, And it's differential. If everybody had the same, if everybody had the same level of awareness, then that would say uh, you have a financial market which satisfies expanding for that level of awareness. And even though there might be undiscovered financial contracts out there which would enable people to trade, no one's thought of them. And in some sense, that's our business situation before we had futures markets for the relevant purposes. No one was aware of of the no one was aware of the possibility of trading on high and low future, future prices, uh, that, in the, that wasn't part of people's awareness in the sense in which they needed it to, tra to trade them on financial markets. And again, uh, the kind of awareness we're talking about is, is not merely a vague awareness that something can happen, it has to be uh, embodied in a state-continued state description of the world. So even though I'm, I, you know, I've been to the US and understand that they have a different currency, uh, that in, the, in my example doesn't translate into me being Aware of aware of the states of the financial markets in a relevant way. So, um, if everybody has identical correct beliefs, uh, then very straightforward. We get the conclusion that any kind of constraint you might impose makes us worse off. We have differential endowments uh, and uh, possibly engage in production. Uh, if we can freely trade, we can pull all the, we can pull all of the idiosyncratic risk in the economy and um, uh, and we can also uh, allocate the aggregate risk uh, to the people who are most willing to, you know, the people who are least risk averse can bear more of the aggregate risk in the economy. So there are obvious gains from, uh, gains from trade here. Uh, and as long as everyone has correct beliefs, it can't possibly be uh, efficient to constrain them. What if agents have different wrong beliefs? Well, in this case, um, we don't go into this in too much detail, but if, different, if agents have different wrong beliefs, uh, then they're willing to bet against each other. And, in, and ex ante and from their own perspective, this is a mutually beneficial trade. If I think that the stock market is highly likely to go up and you think it's highly likely to go down, uh, we're both willing to bet and as free individuals would choose to do so. But clearly one of us has to be wrong in our, at least one of us has to be wrong in our judgment of the probabilities. And so from the perspective of somebody who, uh, from the perspective of somebody who has correct beliefs, um, at least one of us has to be worse off out of this and potentially both of us might be. That is, we both might put too much of our wealth, uh, take on too much risk uh, associated with the state we think is likely compared to, um, uh, compared to the, optimal, uh, the optimal outcome, which might be no trade. And so this idea of no betting, betting for improving, yes, if you think about just a simple case where uh, 
in, in fully aware equilibrium, uh, we wouldn't try, we have identical preferences and identical endowments. Uh, and then we have a symmetric error that I incorrectly overweight one, one state and you incorrectly underweight it. Uh, then uh, the portfolios we end up with are both more risky than the portfolios we started with, uh, with, with the same expectation. And um, that implies that a, a similar notion of true Pareto efficiency, uh, that, um, that incomplete markets in these cases can actually actually be beneficial. And this is the kind of reason, one of, one of the reasons why uh, pure gambling transactions are frowned on and widely prohibited. Now, bound awareness in court, in the form of coarsening imposes constraints on the portfolios we can hold. That is, if I'm not aware of a financial asset, then I can't bet on it. If I'm not aware of the states underlying the financial asset, I can't, I can't form beliefs about those states and bet on it. And uh, these implicit constraints might be both individually rational and socially optimal, rational in, in an appropriate sense, uh, relative to our, our bound awareness, not relative, of course, to uh, the infinitely rational agent of, of your surrounding results. And one way of, of implementing this is to introduce, uh, introduce heuristics, uh, adopt constraints in our own, own investment choices. They can, these can be ecologically rational in the sense of coherence. So that is, uh, in the actual environment we're in, which we can't fully understand, they turn out to work. So here's, here's our model. We just think of, uh, uh, a, it's a discrete time model with infinitely many states. Uh, we have um, infinitely many uh, periods uh, and we have um, uh, an IOID process uh, in this illustration just with three states. In general, we work with a finite number of states, which, um, and, and in this context, uh, a path is just a, a series of state realizations and we'll see this in the next slide. Um, so here's the path, which is um, uh, starts at S0, the first state observed is S2, the second state observed is S3. Now, consider somebody who's boundedly aware, and here's where we introduce coarsening. So what, what coarsening means is uh, you don't, a person with coarse awareness in this case doesn't distinguish between state two and state three. Uh, they're different and they're relevant to some asset payoffs, uh, but um, but the um, uh, but the person doesn't uh, doesn't distinguish between them, and so um, and so for them uh, the set of paths is correspondingly smaller uh, because any place where either S two or S three occurs on the path is treated the same. So here's the um, so here's the picture. So uh, if we look at the red and green paths, they are in fact distinct, but from the point of view of an agent, agent I, who doesn't distinguish S2 and S3, uh, the first state is the same, uh, and so is the um, and so is the second state. So they're just two occurrences of this um, of this joint of this uh, merge state S2 and S3, an event in in the ordinary terminology. An event in the state space corresponds to an, an atom, atomistic state uh, in the in the um, in the awareness of the individual. So here's the um, now. Anne is the expert in this stuff, so um, uh, I won't try and recall from my stochastic processes exactly what's being said by the natural filtration here. But but the general idea is 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 pretty clearly that um, uh, that we have. Uh, a seed of events uh, for any finite, so for any finite set, this is really just an algebra, of course, it only, only becomes a sigma algebra uh, as we extend, extend out to infinity, which uh, uh, we will, will need for some of our limiting results. Okay, so here's the economy, it's very standard, um, just one consumption good. Um, a, consumer, a set of consumers, uh, who, um, whose preferences are, uh, are, are standard uh, and each of them has a consumption plan uh, which has to be 
I think the main points, if I can just select it really, the main point that's we haven't, that's different from the very, the absolutely standard bird, is this, this line here. If they're boundly aware, their consumption has to be measurable with respect to their awareness. So they can't consume differently uh, in two states, um, in two states of which, there are, of which they don't, which they don't distinguish. And we assume this is also true of their endowment. That is, uh, they come with an endowment which is, con is consistent with their awareness. Their endowment doesn't tell them uh, that there's something they're missing in their model. Uh, and so if they don't engage in trade, this condition is satisfied. Uh, if they do engage in trade, it has to be with assets which are, are measurable. And um, so we have uh, the police or IID, uh, which is also true of the process. Uh, and we have uh, yeah, the standard thing for the total endowment of the economy. Uh, useful there to remember, we'll be looking at both the cases of no aggregate uncertainty, where there's only the idiosyncratic risk and of aggregate uncertainty. So first, um, uh, we, we define um, uh, an equilibrium uh, in terms of um, in terms of a price over over paths, uh, and we have to have a, uh, a cons each individual has to have a consumption stream which is optimal for them, uh, given the prices that they face uh, uh, they face for our state contingent consumption plans. Uh, and this is generated by uh, this is generated by the set of assets available to them. Uh, so this is this is at this stage we're just in consumption space. We haven't worried about what assets we need to uh, uh, to generate these uh, generate these consumption paths. We just imagine that people can trade claims over paths of which they are aware. So now let's look at an example, my simple one. Um, so this example has, has four states of the world. Uh, I find it convenient to think of them as, as being objectively all having probably a quarter, but that doesn't, we, we don't need that. Uh, and what we see is that there's, um, there's both idiosyncratic and, um, and uh, systematic risk. So in states one and two, the aggregate endowment is three, uh, but Anne is better off than Bob. Uh, in states three and four, state three, the aggregate endowment, sorry, the aggregate endowment yeah, is two, uh, but there's no uh, idiosyncratic risk in state, um, in state four, the aggregate endowment is four, and again, no idiosyncratic risk. Uh, we have identical beliefs and identical utility functions. Uh, so in this case, uh, with full awareness, Anne and Bob are going to insure each other against idiosyncratic risk. That is, uh, assuming the state three to be probable, uh, Anne will give uh, Bob uh, a half a unit of consumption in state one, uh, Bob will give Anne a half a unit of consumption in state two. Uh, obviously, if the probabilities are different, we adjust in terms of, uh, we adjust to make sure that just that the probabilities, the, pro the state claim prices are proportional to the probabilities of those two states. Uh, there's of course nothing they can do in states three and four. Uh, they both have the same endowment and they understand the model, so they're not um, the same endowment. So uh, no trade takes place here. Now let's look at the case where, um, where there's differential awareness. So in this case, we keep Anne fully aware, uh, but Bob is only aware of a coarse partition, uh, namely S1, S3 is one element and S2, S4 is the other. Uh, that's Bob's consumption. So Bob is just a, an ordinary old person, doesn't know about, in this context, doesn't think very much about financial markets, knows that uh, their own endowment can be either good or bad, and that's the only, yeah, the only, the only way they distinguish states is, is my endowment good or bad? Uh, so they understand that, uh, Bob understands this. Uh, Bob in this context would like to purchase insurance. If they could get, if Bob could get it at a, a good price, he'd like to do so. Um, you know, we could think of, of, of uh, the one and three states are states where Bob incurs some insurable loss of some kind. Bob might be a, a farmer in one and three of the drought states, for example. So, um, so Bob's in the market for insurance. Uh, Anne you know, doesn't particularly want to insure Bob in state three because uh, uh, she's already as badly off as he is. Uh, but the only way to trade with, with Bob is a trade which says, um, I will pay, uh, I, Anne, will give you money 
in uh, states. Um, uh, now, I'll give you money in states. Uh, uh, get this right. Uh, in states uh, one and three, and you'll give me money in states two and four, and that uh, uh, that on average A is better off in in the event consisting one and three, and on average B is better off in the events uh, consisting in two and four. Uh, so this is a beneficial trade. Uh, what we see though is two things. One is uh, the idiosyncratic risk represented by by one and two isn't fully eliminated, uh, and the other is that. Um, is that uh, because um, uh, because uh, Anne is uh, paying out in um, in state three, Bob gets and receiving money in state four. Bob's getting so, and Bob is getting some insurance against aggregate risk. Conversely, um, conversely, A is actually uh, Anne is actually more exposed to aggregate risk than she was before she entered into the contract. Uh, so, so this is the flavour of the kind of outcome we get when uh, uh, when one or more agents is is unaware. So, what does this mean? Well, can we observe this? And uh, this part is um, uh, a little bit tricky, and uh, mainly Arnie will probably explain it slightly better than I do. But consider consider these two states of the world. One is for the economy as a whole is a good state and the other is a bad state for the economy as a whole, uh, but at least some agent I uh, doesn't, um, some agent I doesn't uh, uh, distinguish between these two states. So this agent isn't affected by whatever, isn't affected by the aggregate, uh, aggregate uncertainty here, that their, their, their income's the same. And we ask the question, suppose there is an equilibrium as we would define it for the differential awareness economy. Uh, so the equilibrium has to have the property that I is consuming the same amount in these two states because it has, to be, it has to be measurable with respect to their awareness. And we ask the question, could this be mistaken for a full awareness economy? Could we produce a full, full awareness economy that delivered the same, uh, delivered the same uh, equilibrium? Uh, and if that's generically true, then that suggests that we're never really going to be able to observe anything about this um, about this differential awareness economy. Uh, but in fact, we have a couple of observations. Uh, first, if there, are, if there are beliefs which give rise to this economy, uh, to, to this equilibrium, they have to be heterogeneous uh, because uh, I, has to, I, has to, um, I has to end up with the same beliefs, uh, the same outcomes in both states. Uh, and that requires, uh, uh, that, requires that uh, not everybody that, that, this, that uh, uh, trade, go, trade allows uh, equalization, uh, I, I, to equal, I to equalize, even though with common beliefs, I would be offering insurance, common beliefs and full awareness, I would be offering insurance to other people who, had, who were subject to the aggregate risk. Uh, and in particular, what this means is uh, there must be an agent, uh, there must be an agent for whom I underestimates the probability of, of the good state uh, relative to, to J uh, so, that, uh, so that we can get this uh, partial insurance, we can get away from this partial insurance result. And further, um, I, I don't think I can justify this one. I only proved it and I haven't got the answer on this one. Uh, we imply that beliefs can't be IOD, that they have to vary according to, um, they vary over time. So I, Apologise, I can't give you an intuition for that result. So the next issue is the survival issue, and this is uh, uh, this is the part of the paper that runs most closely parallel to the econometrical paper. If you, if you read it, in that paper we showed that uh, whereas essentially no one survives except the person with correct beliefs in the full aware in the unconstrained economy, uh, with aware with differential awareness, uh, people can survive. Uh, even though, uh, even though they have wrong beliefs, and so our first result is with no aggregate, um, of course, with no aggregate uncertainty, everybody survives. There's just um, uh, there's going to be no trade other than um, uh, other than uh, insurance, um, and so that that's, everyone has correct beliefs. Uh, when agents have have the same awareness partition, so they don't need to be fully aware, but they all need. No one can be aware of a partition that someone else isn't, uh, then we get the classic Bloom and Eze result. 
that only the agent. Yeah, I've just got a question which will answer. Uh, um, Only the agent who are closest to the truth in this callback legal sense uh, will survive, everyone else vanishes. And this is just the usual result that we get uh, from, from Bloom Management. Now, um, as long as everybody has, as long as everyone has correct beliefs, it doesn't matter for survival that you're unaware. Uh, what all you lose by being uh, uh, by being less aware than other people is uh, some potential opportunities for mutually beneficial insurance. Uh, so, um, uh, so if if somebody else if I'm uh, if I'm Bob in my story uh, in the story before and I have correct beliefs, I don't vanish. I just 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 that I don't fully insure, and and Anne doesn't uh, against the asymptotic risk. And so we get a less efficient outcome than we would if everybody were fully aware, uh, but everyone survives. Now, uh, what about the case where uh, you're both unaware and wrong? Well, in that case, you're out of luck. If you have uh, coarse beliefs and another agent not only has finer beliefs, which means they can trade with you across your entire partition, uh, but also more accurate beliefs, uh, then uh, you will vanish almost surely in exactly the same way as the um, as the uh, as in Bloom and Easley. Uh, if you think of just two agents and ignore any pricing things, it's just like the the only trade takes place with respect to the less aware agent's partition. And we're back in the Bloom and Easley world where, since the less aware agent also has wrong beliefs, uh, they vanish almost surely. Now, uh, we need this technical definition, which basically says, um, uh, you, if you have wrong, if you have coarse beliefs, but in the long run, in the long run, those beliefs, in the long run, those beliefs don't affect anything relevant to the aggregate and to the aggregate endowment economy, uh, then, um, then your party, then ultimately your, uh, your beliefs are irrelevant in the limit. So, um, so it might be that in the early stages of this process, my, my unawareness matters, uh, but as we, as we go out, it becomes less and less important. So in effect, uh, in effect, I become fully aware of everything that's relevant to the, uh, everything that's relevant to the aggregate process of the economy. And conversely, uh, uh, if that's not true, my unawareness is relevant to the limit and therefore relevant to my survival. And to put it, um, uh, to spell that out, as the remark says, in the limit, I could just have a share of the aggregate endowment of the economy and, uh, and that would be fine. And that suggests the kind of equilibrium that we would have where uh, with, uh, with similar, with identical uh, preferences, uh, we would have, um, with identical preferences and admissible and limit, everybody would share in the aggregate, everybody would, would share in the aggregate endowment of the economy uh, in, uh, in proportion to the present value of the world. Right here. And we can also, that's for the, that's relevant to the economy as a whole, we can also define this relevant to another agent. That if, if, my, if in the end, uh, we just have the same same awareness for everything. If I have the same awareness for, it, for everything that's relevant to you, uh, then my awareness is irrelevant to the limit as far as trade between you and me is concerned. And we get the same kinds of results. Uh, and we just need to rule out this irrelevant unawareness because, as as the name implies, it doesn't matter for survival if you have irrelevant. Now let's look at nested awareness partitions. And this is the same as more or less constrained agents in the econometrical paper. But yeah, that, uh, if, you, if, you, if you simply have a set of assets, the more assets, you know, and we simply have agents ordered by inclusion in terms of the set of assets they can, they can trade, we get exactly the same results.
So we have nested awareness partitions so that uh, W1 is the most aware person. Um, and we have also ordered, uh, ordered Kubrick level distances and make sure I've got this the right way around. Um, so this says that, um, that agent I, I think I have this right, it's further away from the truth than agent J of the lower order one. Um, let's see. Yeah, so this is the story, good, where um, each agent's, uh, as you get less, less coarse awareness, uh, you also get, um, uh, you also get um, uh, more accurate beliefs relative to the others, and therefore you get those two things cancelling out and the agents, uh, the agents survive. Uh, we just, uh, yeah, so this is the strongest version of the result. Uh, we have to take care with these orderings of awareness. Uh, we need not only Kubert leading distance from the truth, uh, but also from the agent immediately above you in this, in this nested hierarchy. Uh, this gives us a, um, a condition, um, uh, this gives us a condition under which all agents, all agents survive, uh, even though we have differential awareness and incorrect beliefs. Yes. So, so why is can, yeah. can I ask you something? So yeah. this so you are so you're making an assumption which is that if I'm less aware than you my beliefs must be more accurate than yours. Is that correct? Uh, well, it's not an assumption. It's a condition rather than an assumption. That is, there's no reason to think that should be true. But if it's, but it's, if it okay, is, but, it, but if it's true, then then you have the the result. Yes. And how, I mean, how plausible do you think that that is? I mean, because this seems yeah. to run against, you know, the the sort of intuitive notion of an awareness that I may have without looking at your at the literature, right? So I'm unaware of things, yeah. meaning I should have worse beliefs than someone who's more aware of of things. Uh, well, I mean, one way of thinking about it. One way of thinking about this is, um, well, I think this makes sense, is suppose you have two boundedly rational agents and uh, one of them puts resources into uh, exploring, exploring possibilities, discovering new financial assets into financial innovation, and the other puts the same, same resources into fundamental research. At the fundamental in the, in the market sense. So I spend my time I spend my time looking at Australian bonds and, and working out what could happen to them. And you I spend a lot of time looking at derivatives in which you trade off Australian bonds against mm -hmm. um, against foreign assets. Right. In that context, it seems plausible that um, uh, that uh, I might have more accurate beliefs about the market I know about. Yeah. And will come come and this will come in the heuristic context. I might have more accurate beliefs about the market I know about at the cost of being unaware of options available to me. Sure. Okay. Uh, and, and in a sense, the heuristics we come to will sort of, uh, will sort of get you to that uh, no, that's, in a that, way. That's a good way of, so if, if, uh, if, if uh, you know, if cognitive processes are, uh, are limited uh, resources, then yeah, sure. You, you, it's a good explanation actually, thanks. Okay, great. Um, okay, so, um, What's happening here? Well, um, J is less aware. Um, J can survive. They have more accurate beliefs, uh, but J can't. Um, J can't consume the total endowment in the limit because there has to be stuff left over. J's endowment is coarse relative to the total endowment, and so um, so we can't have an equilibrium uh, in which J gets everything, which is the condition we need for I to vanish. So, as just as we had an example, uh, with differential awareness, we can have limited risk share and producing credit risk. That is, e even though, even though ideally everyone would like to, to trade that away, they can't do that because of bounded awareness. Uh, and we can have state prices that are biased. And we'll come. We'll look more at the example and see both of these, uh, both of these points. And I think this question, yeah, this question actually, Menke asked this a while ago and we've come to it. Uh, 
when they're non-nested, uh, trade, well, actually, this, this is the more general point, uh, for non-nested agents, but indeed for any, any two agents, uh, we can only trade on the coarsest common refinement. So in the case of nesting, that's the agent with the, that's the endowment of the agent with the coarser awareness. In the case of two, two agents with non-nested, we have, we have a ladder structure and it has to be the agent with, it has to be the coarsest common refinement. Um, and so we look again at our uh, economy with these, these four states. Uh, we're going to give them now somewhat different awareness. Uh, so each of them in this story is aware only of the, only of the stuff that affects them and there can be no trade. Uh, so so um, uh, the course is common refinement in this context is, is the whole set. Uh, so um, uh, so in, in this kind of story, which is, is in some sense your classic story of risk before insurance. You know, I've got a car that might crash, you've got a car that might crash, uh, but we haven't worked out. Uh, neither of us is in any relevant sense aware of that. Uh, so we each bear our own losses. And what that means, of course, is it doesn't matter what our beliefs are, since we're not trading, we both survive. Uh, and the general point is, uh, if I can distinguish two states that no other agent can distinguish, then I have to consume, I have to do the consumption across those states. Uh, and if that matters in the limit, then I have to have some positive consumption in the limit, and that means I'm going to, going to survive. So let's run through these things. Uh, we have two agents, identical endowment, endowments, uh, identical beliefs on J's endowment, on J's partition rather than the course of partition and identical utility functions. Then uh, I has to come out better off because I has, uh, I has access to all the trades that, that we have the same endowments. I has access to all of the insurance opportunities that J has. Uh, plus more. And so, um, so I have to have higher utility uh, as a result of this than Jay does, uh, assuming, um, uh, oh no, sorry, there's the, yeah, so um, now, but if it's the case that, uh, that so that's true for correct beliefs, but for incorrect beliefs, it may be the case, and this is again more or less the kind of story I was telling uh, I was telling to JC. But the bad version of this, uh, we both understand the uh, both understand the world the same way with respect to uh, respect to the parts that I'm aware of. Uh, but I has wrong beliefs on the finer partition, so uh, so we're both equally equally right or wrong. If we only if, if we trade between ourselves, but when I goes out into the market uh, with the finer partition, uh, there yeah, they have beliefs that are further from the truth than um, uh, uh, than uh, than some agent K uh, who who can trade with them, and therefore uh, I trades with K and vanishes in the standard um, in the standard Lumiere kind of way. Uh, J doesn't travel doesn't. Um, uh, doesn't trade with, uh, uh, doesn't you know, has the same beliefs as K, and therefore, therefore, in trade with K, uh, also survives. Uh, so that leads to the conclusion that, yeah, you know, really, it was pretty unfortunate for Jay in that story that they became aware of these financial markets if they hadn't known about them, or hadn't been if they hadn't known about the uh, about the partitions of the world that they could trade on, uh, then uh, then they would have survived like like Jay did, as is they vanished. And so this is a formalization of the of this condition. Let me go on for time. Yep, so here we go. So this is a sort of um, a, a set of conditions. I don't not the most general, but they turn that that example uh, into a general condition that the uh, individual is better off from being boundly aware. Um, we have to have this idea that we we are. Um, uh, uh, we, I is far away from the truth, but has a reasonably um, uh, is is correct on a. Uh, you know, they have the option of trading on a bit that they're aware of, 
and have accurate beliefs, but overall they're away from the truth. Uh, you've mentioned this, I'm running slightly on time, so I might skip over the, oh, you know, I will say this. So social optimality with heterogeneous beliefs. So just to spell out the problem here, um, supposing that I think um, horse A is bound to win a race and you think that horse B is bound to win the race uh, with very high probability, uh, ex ante, we both look as if we're better off, uh, we're better off betting, betting our beliefs. Uh, but of course, um, uh, supposing that the truth is that where the horses are equally like to win, uh, from the perspective of an outside observer, uh, our bets have made us worse off. We've exposed ourselves unnecessarily to risk. And in a sense, that always has to happen uh, in the context of uh, organised gaming, where the thing you're betting on has no implications for your endowment outside the casino or, or horse, race, horse racing track. Uh, you can't possibly be insuring yourself against any other kind of risk. Uh, so the betting must make at least some people worse off relative to the truth and can potentially make everyone worse off with the truth. And that's, uh, that's in, in some sense, the typical belief of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, anti-gaming view is nearly everyone is worse off. The only, yeah, the only people who are, who are better off in the market are those uh, who are uh, providing the services and taking a rake off, the bookmakers or the casino as the case may be. So this gives you this idea of no betting Pareto, Pareto uh, dominance, that there is a single belief uh, that um, every agent, for which every agent would believe that um, uh, if they all shared this belief, they'd prefer uh, the first to the second. And we can show that, um, uh, and we have a similar definition for uh, a true Pareto, of, true Pareto efficient, which is, uh, the more restrictive view it has to be better under the true beliefs we know those. Uh, so we have this story now, uh, Anne and Bob are back again. Uh, we can see that um, uh, in this case, we have different beliefs. Uh, A has correct beliefs and B has, um, uh, B has incorrect beliefs, uh, but um, uh, the, um, uh, the, yeah, so what we see is that uh, B actually, uh, because they overestimate the probability of, um, of states two and three, uh, will buy more consumption in those states. In particular, can end up um, uh, can end up consuming more uh, in um, uh, certainly ends up more consuming therefore more in state two than state one, even though the aggregate endowment of the economy is the same. Uh, so, so there are a lot of bad features of this outcome. Uh, in this context, uh, financial constraints. Uh, uh, preventing certain kinds of trade can be beneficial. Um, and um, what we get, therefore, is that if, if B weren't aware of the full, full set of possibilities, uh, we can be made, uh, we can be made, B can be made better off, running low in time here. And so what we show is that in these contexts, uh, unawareness can be, uh, can be beneficial. I'll skip to the end so we have time for discussion. Let's, and talk, talk a little about heuristics, which Just going to jump past these slides here. I mean, the answer is can financial constraints be so dropped in? And the answer is yes. So, heuristics. So, it turns out uh, heuristics are super controversial, at least in certain circles. So, like uh, Giga has these nice stories about heuristics which sound really appealing, uh, but you don't have to put up much in the way of a Facebook or a Twitter post about it in the right academic circles uh, before you have. The kind of fight you would think would be going on about Trump versus Biden or something like this between people who think Gearing's uh, heuristics are great and people who think they're terrible. Um, and, um, and so certainly so cognitive scientists really fight about this stuff. Uh, and uh, so in a different context, as I discovered in work with uh, Laurie Paul, who's a philosopher, our philosophers also have a whole bunch of, of uh, very much as hot buttons about, about this question of heuristics. But, Undeterred by this, we're going to use the term and say just a heuristic uh, in this context, yeah, could be just a portfolio constraint. 
And the obvious one is don't trade an asset you don't understand. If you see this asset um, and somebody comes along and says, look at the Marvel's track record of this asset. And they say, well, how's it constructed? And the answer is either, well, look, I can't tell you how it's constructed because uh, it's my secret intellectual property. You just have to trust me. Or alternatively, uh, here's this five pages of maths with Gauss and Coppins explaining how it works. Um, in either of those cases, the heuristic is saying, look, right, yeah, sounds great. And I'm sure, sure uh, for social discussion purposes, it's a marvelous asset, but I'll stick to the stuff I understand. Uh, and another constraint, yeah, which we haven't really modeled dynamically is, is only, uh, only invest in assets you can get out of. Uh, and we can see heuristically that um, if we're, uh, if, if our participation in financial markets has the potential to uh, drive us to zero, uh, then we don't want to have a fully, fully specified say, contingent plan as we can have with Bloom and Easley. Rather, we'd like to be able to uh, change our plan as, as, as evidence emerged. Um, and uh, just preference for certainty, just say, um, I don't invest in the set. Yeah, a, a strong version of this is look, don't go into the share market. However clever you might think about it, there are people cleverer than you, you're just going to lose your money. So, um, First, obviously, heuristics can simplify your decision-making process. So um, that's one of, the, one of the arguments for them. Uh, and this is the classic, um, classic story going, I guess, in a sense, right back to Milton Friedman and the billiards player, for those who remember him. Uh, you can, um, uh, uh, you can uh, solve the, um, the multi-body problem on the billiard table, or you can have a heuristic that says, look, uh, whenever you want the ball uh, to hit, this other ball, just, just make sure the cue is a tiny bit to the right of centre and you'll be right. Um, I'm not a good enough player to even know what the heuristic is. Uh, then famously, the gaze heuristic for catching the baseball, uh, that you just keep your eye on the ball and run towards, uh, uh, run towards uh, and adjust your course uh, in line with that. Uh, and again, as I say, the cognitive scientists vigorously dispute whether, whether baseball catches or cricket people catching a ball actually use this heuristic or not. Um, now they can result in better decisions and, um, and uh, where they do, uh, they're ecologically rational in the sense that in the actual environment in which you operate, uh, uh, you turn out better. But the problem with ecological rationality, unlike Alman style rationality is uh, you can never know your own beliefs to be ecologically rational, uh, in, at least in the context as a response to bounded awareness, uh, because uh, to, to determine the ecological rationality of an outcome, you have to be fully aware of the relevant state space. So an outside observer or you looking at your own past decisions can say, yes, this was an ecologically rational decision. Uh, you can never be sure uh, uh, that the environment you're in in the future is going to be like that. So, um, uh, so that's the uh, that's the summary. I suppose I'll, I'll advertise uh, stage two, which is to say, uh, in all of this stuff and in Bloom and Easley, we've had people uh, coming into the market with different beliefs. Uh, where do they come from? What do we do about Almond and people like that? And uh, the answer we propose to say is uh, we can get the differential beliefs from reduced awareness. And one way of thinking about this is we've got a bunch of events that might happen. Uh, one way of getting probabilities is to count up all the ways the events might happen. And as a heuristic say, well, we, we, if we can do this in a symmetrical way, we can just make the probabilities of those events proportional to the number of ways they can happen. Uh, and in that context, if you miss out on some ways a particular event can happen, you'll underestimate its probability relative to an event where you've seen all the ways it can happen. And this is indeed a, um, a characteristic you can observe. Uh, if you look, go back to um, go back to nuclear reactors and the Three Mile Island disaster, which was in the 1970s, uh, there'd been a previous study suggesting that uh, a nuclear reactor core meltdown was incredibly, incredibly unlikely. And they'd done this by 
essentially by tracing all the paths they thought of that a nuclear reactor could fail, estimating how likely each path was, and then that, that was their answer. And when three mile had happened, it turned out it was something fairly like what they considered, but not in their list. And so when you corrected for those things, you got a substantially higher probability of meltdown than, than the study had estimated. Uh, and therefore, of course, a conversely lower probability of non meltdown. Um, okay, so that's it. We've got a little bit of time. Oh, I've used up all my time, so sorry about that. But um, uh, happy to hang around for discussion uh, with anybody who wants to after this. Thanks very much. Are you one? Are you because you're muted? Sorry, I was saying any, any questions for John before uh, we adjourn? Let's uh, give him a, a virtual round of applause. And, uh, and so whoever wants to hang up uh, a little while, for a little while, John is happy to, to stay here connected, and so will I. So every, for everyone else, uh, next uh, week we have uh, Laura Doval uh, talking about uh, mechanism design. Uh, so please uh, tune in, okay? Bye-bye, everyone. everyone.